Hello, good morning again. Uh, time for our keynote. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Kathleen is Director of Digital Humanities and Professor of English at Michigan State University. She's also Project Director of Humanities Commons, an open access, open source network serving more than 16,000 scholars and practitioners in the humanities. Kathleen is the author of several books, including most recently, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Save, Saving the University. At the core of this book are explorations of the relationship between higher education and the communities it seeks to serve, and responses to the shifting conceptualization of education from public to a private good. This is very much a conversation I feel our community should be part of, contributing to and participating in. So thanks for helping us to engage further, Kathleen, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Ian. I really appreciate it. And I want to start by thanking you for inviting me to speak here today and also to the Open Aperio team for making it possible um, for me to join today. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity. Um, I'm assuming my slides are coming through and that you're able to hear me. I will take that loud as a yes. Very, loud and very clear. Awesome. Good. Okay. So onward in that case. Um, much of what I have to say today grows out of the work that I did in the book that Ian just mentioned in Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. Um, the book overall makes the argument that rebuilding a relationship of trust between the university and the public that it ostensibly serves is going to require regrounding our institutions and the work that we do in them in a mode of what I refer to as generous thinking, focusing our practices and our modes of communicating around building community and solidarity both on campus and across the campus borders. And a key component of that work lies in recovering the public nature of that work by rejecting the privatization that has overtaken so many of our campuses, and not least through the information systems that we invest in and deploy. Now, the radical approach part of the book's subtitle grows out of my sense that the necessary changes in front of the academy are huge and that they can't be made incrementally that they instead require, as Chris Newfield notes in the conclusion of his book, The Great Mistake, a paradigm shift, because there is no easy route, no approach, no tool that can simply take us from where we are today to where we want to be. As Tracy McMillan Cottom has noted of the crisis that she has seen growing in higher education today, this is not a problem for technological innovation or a market product. This requires politics. The problem for the university, after all, begins with politics. The institutions that not too long ago served as a highly accessible engine of social mobility, making rich liberal arts-based education broadly available, have been utterly undone. We face today not just the drastic reduction in that institution's affordability, but an increasing threat to its very public orientation as rampant privatization not only shifts the burden of paying for higher education from the state to individual students and families, but also turns the work of the institution from the creation of a shared social good, a broadly educated public, to instead focus on the production of market-oriented individual benefit. And the impact of individualism across our culture has similarly undermined the possibilities for collective action in a wide range of fields. In generous thinking, I ask the university as an institution to undergo a fairly radical transformation by returning its attention to the public's and the public good that it is intended to serve. And though I'm certain that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in a whole lot of the talk ahead, I'm focused on that same message here today. Because however committed you as individuals are to the collective project that Aperio represents, most of you still work in institutions whose priorities and reward structures may not align with your own. And those reward structures have to be changed. 
So this is the conclusion that was reached by, in a, by a study that was conducted by Juan Alperin and his colleagues um, entitled, How Significant Are the Public Dimensions of Faculty Work in Review, Promotion, and Tenure Documents? Now the TLDR on this is not very. Um, the study demonstrates the extent to which, as the authors note, institutions that want to live up to their public mission need to work towards systemic change in how faculty work is assessed and incentivized. If the university is going to work toward the public good, that work has got to be rewarded. And yet the current structure of higher education, the paradigm within which it operates, leaves such collaborative community oriented work un or under rewarded. Now this problem first became painfully clear to me at a meeting um, that was held several years back between university librarians and the directors of the university presses that reported up through them. And this meeting was keynoted um, by the highly distinguished provost of a large state research university. And it was an extraordinary talk. Um, he described his campus's efforts to embrace a renewed mission of public service. And he emphasized the role that broad public access to the faculty's work might play in transforming the environment in which the, the university operates today. The university's singular purpose is the public good, he said, but we are seen as being self-interested. Can opening our research up to the world help change the public discourse about us? It was an inspiring talk. It was rich in its analysis of how the university found its way into the economic and social problems it now faces, and it was hopeful in thinking about new possibilities for renewed public commitment. Or I should say, it was hopeful right up until the moment when the relationship between scholarly publishing and tenure and promotion was raised. And then it was like somebody had dimmed the lights. We heard about the importance of maintaining prestige within the faculty through modes of assessment that ensure that faculty members are publishing in the highest ranked venues. So frustrated by that shift, I asked the provost during the question and answer period what the possibilities might be for a very important, highly visible research university that understands its primary mission to be service to the public good, to remove the tenure and promotion logjam in the transformation of scholarly communication by convening the entire academic campus from the provost through the deans, the chairs and the faculty in a collective project of revising, I mean, really reimagining all of its personnel processes and the standards on which they rely in light of a primary emphasis on the public good. I mean, what would become possible if all of those policies worked to ensure that what was considered excellence in research and in teaching had its basis in the university's core service mission? Now, the provost's response was more or less that any institution that took on such a project would immediately lose competitiveness within its institutional cohort. Now, to say that this response was disappointing would be an understatement, but if it, it was nothing else, it was at least honest, right? It made absolutely clear where for most research universities, the rubber meets the road and why a lot of talk about openness and impact and public service and generosity falls apart at the point at which it crosses paths with the more entrenched if unspoken principles around which our institutions are actually in, in, organized today. And the inability of institutions of higher education to transform their internal structures and processes in order to fully align with their stated mission and values may mean that the institutions have in fact not fully embraced that mission or their, those values. Or perhaps it's that there's a shadow mission, competition, that excludes the possibility of that full alignment. Now, the worst of it, and the single fact that generous thinking was most driven by, is that the provost was correct, right? As currently structured, the entire system of higher education is engineered from individual institutions to accrediting agencies, funding bodies, and the higher education press to promote a certain kind of competitiveness that relies on a certain kind of prestige. And any institution that seeks to transform the rules or the goals of the competition without dramatically altering its relationship to the system as a whole is likely to suffer for it. 
So what Chris Newfield has described as the mandate to compete all the time forecloses a whole range of opportunities for our institutions, making it impossible for them to take any other approach. But while we have been trapped for the last several decades in this mode of inter-institutional competition, higher education as a sector has been facing what Inside Higher Ed has described as a larger than typical decline in confidence in an American institution in a relatively short time period. And this falling uh, confidence cannot simply be dismissed as evidence of an increasingly entrenched anti-intellectualism in American life, though undoubtedly that is there as well. Rather, this declining confidence in higher education should ask us to contemplate what we believe higher education is for, right? And why the paradigm under which our institutions largely operate, in which the university serves as a producer and disseminator of knowledge, has been in such a protracted conflict with the paradigm under which our function is understood in the broader culture as a producer and disseminator of market-oriented credentials. Even more, and especially at a moment as, such as we're experiencing today, it should make us consider whether in fact both of those paradigms are failing, and if so, why? Now, as Thomas Kuhn noted in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, the failure of a scientific paradigm as it becomes beset by anomalies for which the paradigm cannot account throws the community that relies on that paradigm into crisis. And the resolution of that crisis requires the discovery of a new model entirely, one that can reorder the work done by the community and draw it out of what he describes as the period of pronounced professional insecurity that appears when normal science ceases to function normally. Now, this crisis can only be resolved in Kuhn's model by what he famously called a paradigm shift, the cataclysmic transformation from one way of understanding how science operates to another. Now, there is in 2020 zero question that cataclysm is all around us. My argument is that we must rethink our purpose and our functioning altogether if we are to discover that new paradigm that allows higher education as we want it to be to survive. So generous thinking explores this problem from a number of different angles, asking all of us who care about the future of higher education, faculty, staff, administrators, students, parents, policymakers, trustees, and more, to reorient our thinking about the work of the university from the creation of individual benefit grounded in all of the competition that structures every aspect of life in contemporary institutions of higher education to instead open the gates and focus on the university's role in building community. My colleagues and I, however, have also been trying to think through this problem in a more pragmatic, applied approach through Humanities Commons, a nonprofit, community oriented, and governed network serving humanities scholars and organizations. Humanities Commons attempts to instantiate several of the arguments of generous thinking. First, that higher education, along with individual scholars and instructors that are engaged in it, will benefit from all of us doing more of our work in public, where the publics that we need to support our institutions can begin to see the importance of what we do. And second, that institutions of higher education must do everything they can to resist and reverse the privatization that has overtaken them, restoring service to the public good, not just to their mission statements, but to the heart of their actual missions. Only this return to a fully public orientation, even among universities that call themselves private, can allow us to build the kind of community that can sustain them. And part of resisting privatization, both for scholars and for their institutions, involves turning away from some of the externally developed and deployed systems on which we've become dependent, and instead reserving our investments and our labor for systems and platforms whose infrastructures and infrastructures whose missions genuinely align with our own, whose values mirror our own, and who whose governance we can contribute. And this is true of a wide range of systems and platforms on which higher education relies, but perhaps nowhere has it become more pressing than in thinking about scholarly communication. 
both because these are the mechanisms through which the work of the academy is made public and because these are the systems that have been most deeply privatized at the direct expense of the academy. I mean, we, libraries, publishers, and scholars, need to think collectively about how to turn our attention to developing the shared, publicly-oriented systems that we can count on to support us as we develop new modes of open knowledge sharing, modes that might help higher education re-engage with the public good. But developing this form of collaborative community supported infrastructure will require some careful thinking about the relationships required to build and maintain it and the work that will be necessary to make it sustainable. Um, and we need to think about these platforms precisely because of the extent to which the entirety of the research workflow from discovery, data gathering and analysis, through writing, submission, and publishing, to dissemination, evaluation, and reporting is increasingly concentrated in a very limited number of corporate hands. Though the issues that I'm, I'm discussing today long predate this particular moment, the risk they posed to the Academy came into stark visibility in August 2017 when B Press announced that it had been purchased by the Relics Group, the multinational parent company of publishing behemoth Elsevier. Now, B Press had, of course, been founded in 1999 by two members of the faculty of UC Berkeley's law school in order to provide open access publishing and repository services to institutions of higher education. B Press thus grew out of the Academy and was widely seen as operating with the Academy's values at its heart. And as the B Press website notes, over 500 institutions have purchased B Press services in order to disseminate and preserve the work being done on their campuses in openly accessible ways. And in one fell swoop, these 500 institutions discovered that they were now effectively paying Elsevier for the ability to provide an open alternative to the increasingly monopolistic scholarly communication channels owned by corporate publishing behemoths such as Elsevier. So what had served for years as a key piece of scholarly infrastructure built and run by academics for the academic community appeared to have been turned on that community. I mean, it's not as though anybody had been unaware that B Press was a commercial service all along, but they were one of the good guys, right? And the costs of outsourcing infrastructural needs to them had been balanced against the often impossible task of maintaining locally hosted repository and publishing systems. So B Press provided what many saw as best of breed functionality at a reasonable price, and it supported libraries' desire to connect the gap gathering and preservation of research materials with the ability to make them openly available to the world. But the acquisition of B Press by Relics not only put libraries in the position of unintentionally supporting a growing corporate control, not just of scholarly publishing, but of the entirety of the research workflow, from discovery to production to communication, it also left those libraries anxious about their fundamental ability to control the infrastructures on which they rely in promoting greater public access to scholarship produced on their campuses. So as a result, serious conversations have since focused on the means of supporting open source, academy-owned and controlled infrastructure. Now, this is not an impossible move by any stretch, but it's harder than it might sound, right? Long-standing open access, open infrastructure projects like Archive might suggest some possible areas of concern. Um, by every reasonable me measure, Archive has been exemplary in its uptake, in its independence, and in the ways that it has helped to transform the fields that it serves. But in some crucial ways, Archive has experienced what can only be called catastrophic success, right? a crucial paradigm-shifting project whose growing annual operating costs and mounting infrastructural requirements have demanded increasingly creative mechanisms for the platform's support. So in 2010, the Archive team at Cornell began the challenging work of building a coalition of libraries willing to work together to support the resource. 
Now, our institutions, as we unfortunately know, are largely unaccustomed to this work of cross-institutional collaboration. Um, for one thing, our institutions are far more prone to understand such resources as terrain for competition. And for another, the community building that's required in this process becomes yet another form of labor added on top of maintaining the resources themselves. So I don't know the extent to which such difficulties may have played a role in Archive's 2019 move from the library to Cornell Computing and Information Science. I mean, it's entirely likely that that move is a matter of infrastructural pragmatics. But even so, the challenges of maintaining the kinds of cross-institutional co coalition that are necessary to maintain such a crucial resource remain. Another example with a different narrative might be found in the Sam Vera project. Um, recognizing that no single institution can possibly develop the full suite of systems on which institutional repositories rely, developers at a number of institutions have come together to create a collective solution. As the proverb and their website have it, if you want to go far, go together. Right. But this distributed developer community, like all such communities, has faced challenges in coordination, right? challenges that have caused it, as the other half of the proverb reminds us, to go more slowly than it might. It's also run the risk of fragmenting project priorities. So ensuring the ongoing commitment, not just of the individual developers involved in the project, but of the institutions for which those developers actually work is not a simple matter. And the foundation of the challenges that both Archive and Samvera have faced is the same challenge faced by any number of other projects and programs and initiatives, sustainability. And this is an issue that I've been thinking a fair bit about of late, as my colleagues and I have been working to ensure that humanities commons might be able to thrive well into the future. And those attempts have in turn been encouraged by the funders and um, other organizations that have supported the network's development to this point. They too would like to see the network thrive, but they can't support it indefinitely. We need, they reasonably suggest, a plan for demonstrating that the network will, at some point in the future, be able to support itself. Now, sustainability of this sort is tied up in revenue models and business plans and cost recovery. Um, sustainability is for a nonprofit entity forever tied to kinds of economic concerns that are often very divergent from, if not at odds with, the nonprofit's primary mission. And as a result, these nonprofits remain forever precarious, right? One small miscalculation can make the difference between survival and collapse. But sustainability broadly understood extends to domains beyond the economic. And there's, of course, econ uh, environmental sustainability in which we attempt to ensure that more resources aren't consumed or more waste produced than can be developed or managed in the near term. There's technological sustainability in which we attempt to ensure that projects conform to commonly accepted um, standards that will enable those projects future stability and growth. And all of these forms of sustainability are important to varying degrees to providing for the future of nonprofit and open source projects. But there's another form that gets a good bit less attention and that I think increasingly precedes economic or environmental or technical sustainability, and that's social sustainability. The social aspect points not just to the determination of a group of people to support a particular project, but to the determination of those people to support their groupness, right? So not just their commitment to the thing they're doing together, but their commitment to the concept of together in the first place. Now, ensuring that these commitments are sustained is, I increasingly think, a necessary precondition for the other kinds of sustainability that we're hoping to work toward. And this notion of the role of community in community-supported software and of the best ways of building and sustaining it raises the key question of what it is we mean when we talk about, uh, about community. Now, in an early chapter in Generous Thinking, I explore Miranda Joseph's argument that community often gets invoked as a placeholder for something that exists outside the dominant economic and institutional structures of contemporary life. And in this sense, 
community becomes a sort of relief valve for those structures, a way of mitigating the damage that they do. So we call upon the community to support projects that the dominant institutions of the mainstream economy will not. And this is how we end up with social network based fundraising campaigns to support people facing major health crises, rather than demanding universal health care and elementary school bake sales rather than full funding for education. Community becomes, in this sense, a kind of alibi for the creeping privatization of what ought to be uh, social responsibilities. However, if we recognize that the communities that we form, both on campus and off, can be crucial organizing tools, right? ways of ensuring that our institutions meet their public obligations, we might start to think of the call to community as a form of coalition building, of a developing solidarity. Now, solidarity itself is a concept that's been challenged, of course. I mean, there are important questions that should always be asked about solidarity with whom and for whom. Women of color, for instance, have pointed out the extent to which white feminist appeals to solidarity reinforce white supremacy, demanding that black women put the issue of race aside in favor of a gender-based unity that overwhelmingly serves white women's interests. But I remain convinced that institutions of higher education must embrace forms of solidarity that do not demand that individuals seeking redress for institutionalized injustices drop their own issues and get in line, but instead that recognize that the issues of those individuals are all of our issues too. Right? This form of solidarity asks us to stand together in support of needs that may not necessarily seem to be our own. In this form of solidarity, I am increasingly convinced, is a necessary prerequisite for a successful, sustainable development of nonprofit, open source, community owned networks and platforms. So, what's the connection? Um, for me, sustainability and solidarity connect through the work of Eleanor Ostrom. Ostrom was the first Nobel laureate in economics, in fact, remained the sole Nobel uh, female laureate in economics until 2019. Her work focused on common pool resource management. She argued fiercely against the conventional wisdom that the so-called tragedy of the commons was an inevitability, insisting that community-based systems and structures for ensuring those resources sustainability were possible provided the right modes of self-organization and self-governance were in place. Now, it's important first to focus in a bit on what's meant by the notion of common pool resources. Resources are generally understood by economists to fall into one of four categories um, based on whether they are excludable, meaning whether individuals can be prevented from using them, and whether they're rivalrous, right? Whether one individual's use precludes another. So public goods are those resources that are both non-excludable and non-rivalrous, meaning that no one can be prevented from using them and that no one's use reduces its availability for use by others. By contrast, private goods are both excludable and rivalrous, right? They can be restricted for use by paying customers and their consumption by one consumer can diminish its availability to another. These private goods are typically market-based products or produced and distributed for profit. Club goods are those that are excludable but non-rivalrous, right? Those that can be restricted to paying customers but not diminished by any one customer's use. And finally, goods that are non-excludable but rivalrous are often described as common pool resources. And it's these goods to which the tragedy of the commons, the overuse of shared natural resources is thought to apply. Now at the root of the tragedy of the commons lies the free rider problem, which derives from the assumption that when individuals can't be prevented from using commonly held resources, but also can't be compelled to contribute to them, some number of individuals will avail themselves of the resources without contributing to their support. And as the number of, number of free riders grows, the resources become prone to overuse and eventually become unsustainable. 
the only means imagined to prevent the tragedy of the commons before Ostrom was the external regulation, right? Whether through privatization or natural uh, nationalization. But Ostrom argued in her 1990 book, Governing the Commons, The Evolution of Institutions for Collective Action, that this model, like other such models like The Prisoner's Dilemma, was based on a particular and a particularly pessimistic view of human possibility, right? one that could not escape from its own metaphor. What makes these models so dangerous, Ostrom argued, when they're used metaphorically as the foundation for policy, is that the constraints that, that are assumed to be fixed for the purpose of analysis are taken on faith as being fixed in empirical settings, unless external authorities change them. I would rather address the question of how to enhance the capabilities of those involved to change the constraining rules of the game to lead to outcomes other than remorseless tragedies. So Ostrom's work explored ways of organizing collective action that might ensure the sustainability of commonly held resources. And while Ostrom focused on natural resources such as fisheries, the problems that she described and the potential solutions she explored have some important things in common with institutions of higher education and the nonprofit community developed academy owned software projects like Archive, like Samvera, like Humanities Commons, on which they should be able to rely. Oh, there are lots of potential examples of free and open digital scholarly platforms and projects like these, all of which face a common problem. I mean, there's often sufficient support available for building and implementing such systems, but there aren't funding programs designed to ensure that they can be maintained. And as a result, the tools and platforms accrue technical debt that becomes increasingly difficult to manage, rapidly making the projects appear unsustainable and thus leaving them in danger of real obsolescence. Now, some argue that the best means of ensuring the sustainability of such projects is economic. Right? Eliminating the free rider problem by enclosing the commons, requiring individuals or institutions to pay in order to access them. But this privatization is, in many cases, the problem that these community developed projects were developed in order to evade. So as with Ostrom's fishing communities, it becomes incumbent on us to find the right modes of self-organization and self-governance that can keep these projects open and thriving. So in summer 2018, um, Brett Bobley of the Office of Digital Humanities at the NEH tweeted a question about ways of sustaining such projects. And numerous discussions and threads resulted from that question that are worth reading, but one in particular caught my attention um, that stems from this reply by Hugh Kalis. Um, noting the institutional responsibility for maintaining such projects, with which I absolutely agree, especially when he moves beyond the economic and into issues of labor and credit. However, as I argue in generous thinking, individual institutions cannot manage such responsibilities on their own. Cross-institutional collaborations are required in order to keep open source software projects sustainable. And those collaborations demand that the staff participating in, in, in them not only be credited and paid appropriately for their labor, but most challengingly, that they be supported in dedicating some portion of their labor to the collective good, right, rather than strictly to local requirements. Which is to say, that individual institutions of higher education must begin to understand themselves as part of a community of such institutions and that they need accordingly to act in solidarity with that community. And this is why I increasingly want to argue that sustainability in open source development has solidarity as a prerequisite. A recognition that the interests of the group require commitment from its members to that group at times over and above their own individual interests. So what I'm interested in thinking about is how we foster that commitment. In fact, how we understand that commitment itself as a crucial form of social sustainability. Now, getting institutions to stop competing with one another and start recognizing that they have more to gain from collaboration than they stand to lose in the rankings is no easy task. 
The privatization that has gradually overtaken them since the Reagan era has resulted in a fundamentally market-oriented, competition-based approach to everything that the institution does. And making the argument that this approach has to be set aside is a huge part of what I've tried to do in generous thinking, and it's a huge part of what we're trying to instantiate in Humanities Commons. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that project, um, Humanities Commons began its life at the Modern Language Association, where with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we launched a social network called MLA Commons in 2013. that was designed to provide members of the MLA with a platform for communication and collaboration, both in order to extend year round the kinds of conversations that take place at the annual meetings, but also to provide member, means for members to share their scholarly work directly with one another. Within about 30 seconds of launching the platform, um, we started hearing from our members about their desire to connect with colleagues in other areas of, of the humanities. So we started looking for ways to support those connections across fields. And so with further support from the Mellon Foundation, we first undertook a planning process and developed a pilot project that was designed to, conduct, to connect multiple proprietary commons instances, each serving the membership of a scholarly society. Humanities Commons went live in December 2016, and it linked MLA Commons with common sites that were developed for other society partners. But beyond those proprietary sites, we also wanted to create a space where any researcher or practitioner in the humanities could create an account and share their work. And so we made the decision to open the network's hub to anyone who wants to join across the disciplines around the world, regardless of institutional affiliation or organizational membership. So all Humanities Commons members can take advantage of all of the network's features. They can create rich professional profiles, they can participate in group discussions, they can create websites, and they can deposit and share their work in the network's open access repository. And this fusion of a social network with a library quality repository means that not only is stuff being put into the repository and not only can that stuff be discovered there, but it's also being actively used as there's a community there with which it can be shared. But while fully opening the Humanities Commons hub to free participation by any interested scholar or practitioner has significantly driven the platform's adoption and use, and three and a half years later, we have over 21,000 registered users, it's created some real challenges for our sustainability. Partner organizations have tended to see the value in paying to support the network services as lying in a benefit that they can provide exclusively to their members. So it's understandable, right? They need to provide such benefits in order to keep their members paying dues. But a model like that transforms Humanities Commons from a common pool resource into a club good, right? one whose benefits are exclusive to those who pay. And some early interviews seem to suggest that a number of the organizations who might have paid for the network, if it were an exclusive service, see the openness of the hub as diminishing the network's value to them, rather than recognizing that the network effects of a larger, more open community will ultimately serve their long-term interests. So we've been working to develop a model that will encourage organizations and institutions to invest in the network, to support it in an ongoing way, to recognize that not only do they belong to the network, but that the network belongs to them and its future depends on them. Making that case depends not just on a workable revenue model, but far more importantly, a compelling governance model one that gives member organizations and institutions, as well as individual members, both a voice in the network's future and a stake in its outcomes. As Ostrom argues, a path to sustainability for a common pool resource like Humanities Commons requires us to ensure that building the network's community and enabling it to become self-governing is a precondition for its success. So the future of Humanities Commons, like the future of a host of open source software and community supported infrastructure projects, requires its participants to act in the interests of the collective, even where those interests do not immediately appear to be local. And in this form of solidarity is where real sustainability for academy owned infrastructure and for the academy itself lies.
And it's, of course, where your work in the various Aperio communities lies. Your institutions may, of course, have different structures, different requirements, different needs, and yet you share the same goals, right? the development, distribution, and preservation of new forms of knowledge. And that you're here today looking for new ways to meet your shared goals despite your different local needs gives me hope. It's a key form of generosity and one that more units on our campuses and more institutions in their engagements with one another need to embrace. Because the bottom line is that the real threat to institutions of higher education today is not other institutions of higher education, right? It's not our place in the rankings that order us. Rather, it's the creeping forces of privatization that continue to undermine our public mission. If we're going to reclaim that mission, if we're going to reclaim the control, control of the work that's produced in and by the university, we're going to have to do it together, right? Acting not just in solidarity with, but with generosity toward the other units within our institutions, toward the other institutions to which we are inevitably connected, and toward the public that we all jointly serve. If we're going to develop and sustain community-supported infrastructure, we have to genuinely become and act as a community. I'm honored to have had this chance to talk with you this morning as you continue the work of building that community. So thank you so much. Kathleen, thank you so much for being with us this morning. That was fascinating. It's so interesting to take a peek over the wall into an area that is so similar to ours and yet so different. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions and other comments and contributions. Uh, I can see virtual applause in the, uh, in the <laughs> chat box. Uh, any questions, other comments, other contributions? So I'm seeing um, a question that just went by from Lucy Abbott um, asking about the difference between tenured faculty contributions to projects and staff contributions and noting that the stakes are, are different for each group. And this is absolutely the truth and is a serious issue that our campuses have to confront. Um, typically right now, in most research institutions, faculty at those institutions retain intellectual property rights over the work that they do on whatever projects they're working on. And um, they also retain a certain level of autonomy in the kinds of research they do and the kinds of collaborative projects that they contribute to. Staff very frequently do not have those same kinds of um, privileges with respect to academic freedom, being able to contribute to any particular project that moves their interests. And on many campuses, all of the work that staff do is considered work for hire and is therefore owned by the university rather than, uh, than being um, intellectual property rights that, that the staff are able to retain. Um, this is a serious issue and one that's got to be dealt with. And I believe that it's got to be dealt with, and this is where the question of solidarity comes back in again, by faculty and staff coming together and insisting that the, the rights that the faculty have with respect to their work have to extend to everyone working on campus. And that we all have to have that same kind of, of sense of investment in the core mission of the institution. Now this will, this will panic a lot of institutions because they look at their faculty and they see them as being effectively free agents, right? I, I you know, do my own work for my own self and I don't feel a kind of loyalty to my institution. That is equally a problem um, that has to be dealt with. And I think that we really need um, to rethink across the categories of employment, what our relationship to the institutions that we work for is and how we, how we come together as a community to support the entirety of that community and its work. So thank you for that question.
questions coming thick and fast. One from Charles Severance to all panelists and attendees. I'm curious about how projects learn to be better over time. Any experience in a project you're involved in? That is a really good question. And it's one that I'm, I'm only sort of beginning to dip my toes into right now. And I think one of the, the keys for Humanities Commons and for our um, attempts to become better has to do with creating multiple channels of communication, multiple points at which stakeholders can talk to us and can talk to each other as well about what they want to see the platform develop into. So that it's not just simply, you know, a governing board that, that rules on everything and everything filters down from there. But there are kinds of checks and balances that come in from having user communities that can provide deep feedback on what's happening with the platform and having technical developer communities that can also drive um, the kinds of transformation that we want to see. And I think it's, it's those kinds of checks and balances that keep the, the, the members of the community in their various kinds of roles, deeply invested in it and feeling like the project is something that they belong to and that also belongs to them. Thank you. I'm from Brian Ollendike. Uh, how can we get groups within an organization in a resource strapped area to realize solidarity leads to better outcomes? Uh, and then comments, visibility, stories rather than competition. Yeah, I mean, this is an enormous question, right? I've, I've given talks about generous thinking a lot of different places. And I was at one particular state institution um, and, you know, I'd just given my sort of standard talk, which is all sort of, um, you know, doom and gloom about the current situation and then total optimism about where I want to see us go. And um, somebody in the audience asked me the question, you know, generosity is all well and good in flush times, right? But how do we how do we internalize the notion of generosity in such a way that an institution can remain generous when times are bad, um, in times of budget cuts, in times of, of resource scarcity and so forth? And I mean, this is the situation that we're all living with right now. Um, all institutions are um, pulling back on resources and are, are um, doing so um, in, ways that demonstrate a wide range of levels of thoughtfulness. Um, I think that it's, it's really crucial at a moment like the one that we're in right now that we think about um, generosity, not just as a matter of having a bunch of resources that I share with you. Times are good and I can, I can you know, hand on resources that I have for you to work on your own thing. Um, but instead to understand generosity as being a sort of mindset, a way of approaching the hard decisions that we have to make about the projects that we're working on. And there are times when those hard decisions um, include budget cuts and they include position reallocation and they include a lot of things that nobody likes and for good reason. Um, but I think the, the key to entering into a moment like that where those hard decisions have to be made um, or to being in a protracted state in, in many institutions in which those, in, those kinds of decisions are always being made is to be making them with mindfulness and with transparency. And that's not to say that everybody is gonna like the outcomes, but if we can get to a place where everybody at least understands the principles on which those decisions were made and how um, they were arrived at, how they're being implemented, um, that can go a long way toward creating a sense that, that all of our, our talk about you know, sa shared sacrifice and being in this together isn't just rhetorical. Right, that it is, there is a real sense that we are all participating in the outcome um, and all contributing to it with our best thinking. So. Kathleen, thanks again so much. We're almost at the end of our time with you, which is a great shame. I'm sure from the discussion window, we can see lots and lots to talk about. Excellent. But stay in touch and it would be great to hear about your progress in the future. We'll do, we definitely. We've got break now.
uh, and that's going to be followed by sessions on CAS and OpenCast in 10 minutes. See you then. Thanks a lot.